Welcome to Demystifying the Process, Best Practices for Applying for Federal Arts, Humanities, and Culture Grants, organized by the White House Initiatives on HBCUs, Arts, History, Humanities, and Culture Cluster. We are a group of federal agencies who have come together to support HBCUs as they apply for grants, explore career paths in these fields for their students, and serve as a reference for HBCU leadership, faculty, and administrators. Our member agencies include the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation, the Department of Education, the Institute of Museum and Library Services, the National Endowment for the Arts, and the National Endowment for the Humanities. Today's presentation will focus on grants at IMLS, NEA, and NEH. Here's a brief agenda for the session. After a quick welcome and introductions, we will have an overview of grants in the federal cultural sector at our agencies, followed by a panel discussion with um, HBCU faculty and staff who have been successful at receiving grants from our agencies. And then we'll have a final wrap up uh, question and answer uh, session. Our agency heads have prepared a brief welcome video for you. I'm Jordan Tannenbaum, Vice Chairman of the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation. Welcome to this session, and I hope you have a productive HBCU week. The ACHP, the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation, strongly supports the work of the White House Initiative on historically black colleges and universities. We are proud to be a part of the arts, humanities and history cluster presenting the session today. The ACHP is an independent federal agency with 24 statutorily designated members. We promote the preservation, enhancement and sustainable use of the nation's diverse historic resources and advise the President and Congress on national historic preservation policy. We also promote the economic, educational, environmental, and cultural values of historic preservation. We work with HBCUs to introduce students to the importance of historic preservation and the telling of the full American story. Through our Building a More Inclusive Preservation Program and Engaging Youth Initiatives, the ACHP has connected with HBCU architecture students, many of whom are now exploring careers in historic preservation. We welcome HBCU students to check out our website and consider applying for internships with us. Thank you very much and have a wonderful session today. I'm Crosby Kemper, the director of the Institute of Museum and Library Services, the primary federal support for libraries and museums in the United States. One of the most important roles we play is the support for African American history and culture. We give it over $25,700,000 in 239 grants over the last 10 years. Especially, we've given support to the historically Black colleges and universities, which have given a leadership role in the history and celebration of African American history and culture, supporting their collections, uh, supporting their professional development, supporting their institutional strength, uh, as they and we celebrate the great role that African Americans have played in American history and culture. Hello, everybody. My name is Rod Joy, and I'm proud to serve as Chief of Staff at the National Endowment for the Arts. On behalf of all of us at the Arts Endowment, I'm very pleased to help welcome you to today's session. For over 150 years, our nation's historically Black colleges and universities have opened doors of opportunity and served as vital agents of equity and excellence in education. When it comes to culture and the arts, America's HBCUs have cultivated creative genius in each and every artistic discipline. From music that moves and iconic marching bands to training the next great wave of curators, 
art historians, and museum directors, our HBCUs have helped nurture and produce some of our nation's foremost creative thinkers and producers. During this week, we would like to express our heartfelt thanks to all of the HBCU faculty, staff, and officials who have worked so very hard to champion and educate artists, promote arts programs, and preserve Black history and culture. Established by Congress in 1965, National Endowment for the Arts is the independent federal agency that works to provide all Americans with diverse opportunities to participate in the arts. The Arts Endowment is proud to support our nation's HBCUs. In the last three years alone, we have directly engaged with nearly 75 HBCUs and we've adjusted our Grants for Arts Projects guidelines to specifically encourage HBCU applications. We hope you consider the Arts Endowment as a ready resource, not just today, but every day. And we hope you enjoy today's session. Thank you all. Hello, I'm Adam Wolfson, Acting Chair of the National Endowment for the Humanities. On behalf of all my colleagues at NEH, I'd like to say how pleased we are to welcome you to today's session on federal funding opportunities for humanities projects at historically black colleges and universities. As one of the largest funders of the humanities in the United States, NEH is heavily invested in supporting our nation's HBCUs by supporting their campus structures, programs, and resources, by preserving and documenting the individual and collective histories of HBCUs, and by supporting advanced research and educational programming at HBCUs. Today, you'll hear from our staff about funding opportunities offered by NEH and about how to apply for an NEH award. NEH awards support individual scholars engaged in advanced scholarly research, as well as educators involved in curriculum development projects. Our grants also support infrastructure projects to expand or preserve on-campus resources and the preservation of valuable humanities collections that document the unique histories of HBCUs. For now, I'd like to just briefly, briefly highlight a few of the many awards we've recently made in support of HBCUs. NEH was especially pleased to be able to commit one million to establish a pilot HBCU cultural heritage stewardship program with the National Trust for Historic Preservation. This project will support the preservation of historic structures and assets of six HBCU campuses. We have also partnered with the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture to provide funding for professional development opportunities for museum professionals at HBCUs. Other, NEA, other NEH grants for HBCUs include support for a digital humanities project at Morehouse College to, de to develop a music visualization platform and an initiative at Spelman College that engages undergraduates in documenting the history of African-American women from around the world. And we are very proud that NEH funding enabled production of Stanley Nelson's powerful documentary, Tell Them We Are Rising, which chronicles the rich history of HBCUs and their role as a haven for black intellectuals, artists, and activists. Thank you for your interest in the National Endowment for the Humanities. I hope that with this session, you'll gain a better sense of NEH and what it does. And I encourage you to, to continue to get to know us and to apply for NEH funding at neh.gov. Thank you very much. First, let me introduce today's speakers. I'm Julia Wynn, a Senior Program Officer at the National Endowment for the Humanities, and I'll be the moderator for the session. I'll be joined by my colleagues, Tamika Shingler, Museums and Visual Arts Specialist at the National Endowment for the Arts and an alumna of Morgan State University, and Mark Isaacson, Supervisory Grants Management Specialist at the Institute of Museum and Library Services. For the panel discussion, we have Lenora Helm Hammonds, Associate Professor of Music at North Carolina Central University, Tina Rollins, Director of the William R. and Norma B. Harvey Library at Hampton University, and Logan Wiedenfeld, Assistant Professor of English at Alcorn State University. 
And now let me turn things over to my colleague, Tamika. Thanks, Julia. Um, we're gonna start off with an overview of grant making at our three agencies in the federal culture sector. And although our agency missions and individual programs are different, we share many commonalities in our grant making processes and our commitment to supporting HBCUs. Um, a few of the big picture concepts, um, you should consult our individual agency websites for information about grant programs and how to put your application together. And in addition, familiarize yourself with grants.gov. Um, it is the federal government's central grants portal, and it's imperative to be up to date on what's needed for applying for a federal grant. Um, our grant support programs, our grant support programs or projects, um, be prepared to um, explain exactly what you plan to do with the funds and how your project fits the grant program to which you are applying. Um, applications are assessed in a competitive um, peer panel review process. And uh, finally, although some agencies do have programs specific to HBCUs, there are other programs that HBCUs are eligible for, and we encourage you to apply for those as well. Um, so what happens to your application once it's successfully submitted? Um, Reminder, just review the guidelines and program descriptions for each agency. Um, once it's, your application is submitted, it's um, sorted into review or review panels. And um, this, could, this may be done in different ways depending on the program. Um, so for example, applications might be grouped by institution type or topic, activity type, or just some other measure that puts like applications with like applications. Um, we then bring in panelists or peer reviewers to assess the proposals, um, making sure that the reviewers have the appropriate, appropriate subject matter and institutional expertise to properly evaluate the applications. And once we have the panelists' evaluations, staff uses them as the basis for formulating recommendations. Um, at NEH and NEA, we present those recommendations to our national council. And those are groups of citizens that are appointed by the president um, and confirmed by the Senate who meet to advise us in grant making and policy. At IMLS, the board does not make recommendations. Staff and where applicable council recommendations are also presented to the chair or director of the agency who by law makes the funding decisions. And it is after this point that we notify application, ap applicants. Um, so as you can see, our application review is a multi-stage process, but it is designed to ensure that each application receives a full and fair review. Um, you can find out about the funding opportunities on our agency websites. Um, on this slide, we have included links to the grants pages of each of our agencies, and those will also be placed in the chat. Um, if you go to these pages, you can explore the full range of the grant programs we offer. Um, Grants.gov is not the only portal where, where you will access the application package and submit your application, but it's a good place to search for funding opportunities across the federal government. Um, there are search criteria that you can use to help um, find these opportunities. Um, and so the information could be a bit overwhelming. So we suggest that you go in with an idea of what you want to search for. Um, your own institution may have a grants office or a sponsored research office, and they should be a partner throughout the entire process. As you're looking for funding opportunities, um, don't forget to consult with this office on your campus um, as they are the professionals and may know the avenues you haven't considered. Finally, consider signing up for the Arts, History, Humanities, and Culture Cluster newsletter. Um, cluster members use the newsletter to announce grant programs that we think would be of special interest to HBCU faculty and staff. And we also highlight awards that we have made to HBCUs as well as other relevant news. Um, you can find, sign up on the link that was put in the chat. Thank you. 
the cluster agencies, as uh, Tamika mentioned, do have some programs that are especially relevant to HBCUs, and we've highlighted some of them on this slide. Uh, in the interest of time, and uh, we're not going to go into uh, detail about each of them, um, you can certainly find more information about these programs and many more uh, on each of our agency websites. Um, and we also have a handout that you can find at the, the bottom of the session screen that has uh, information about these programs as well. Um, some of these programs, for example, awards for faculty at HBCUs, humanities initiatives at HBCUs are um, specifically designated uh, for HBCUs. Others are programs that we think would be especially relevant um, or interesting uh, for HBCUs. Uh, remember, however, that you don't have to limit yourselves to just these programs. If there are um, other programs that you find as you are perusing our websites that you think um, would be a good fit for what you uh, want to do or um, an especially good fit for your institution's mission or priorities, um, definitely uh, consider applying for those other programs as well. Um, we really want you to, to feel empowered to, to apply for the whole range of, of our programs. Once you've decided to apply for a grant at one of our agencies, you can find a wealth of helpful resources on our agency websites. Uh, these resources would include, for example, detailed uh, program descriptions. Uh, which would outline what the programs are designed um, to support, uh, the types of projects and activities they are designed to fund, the program guidelines or notice of funding opportunity, which will lay out in detail what you should include in your application and how your application will be evaluated. Uh, the guidelines will also include the review criteria, um, and these are the very criteria by which your application will be judged and so are very crucial to, to pay attention to. Um, other available resources would include um, webinars, um, a wide range of, of webinars, some dealing with specific programs or guidelines, others for different groups of potential applicants. Um, you would find sample narratives in, in many cases, uh, frequently asked questions and other types of guidance, and also contact information for program staff. And that's, um, I think, an especially important thing to look out for, um, how you can contact us and ask any questions uh, that you might have. Your institution also has resources to offer. Uh, colleagues and mentors can be extremely helpful as you start the grant application process. They can serve as a sounding board to help you refine your ideas or to flesh out your concepts. It's also a really great idea to have colleagues read and provide feedback on your grant application as you're uh, writing it. Um, you may find that there are faculty or staff at your institution who have applied for uh, grants at one of our institutions, have received these grants. Um, if so, see if they would be willing to provide you some guidance about the, the process or maybe even um, you know, provide you with a copy of their own grant application that you can, can look at to see how the pieces are put together. Your institution's administration is in definitely another key resource. You want to make sure that you have your administration's buy-in before you apply, especially if your project is going to involve institutional resources, curricular changes, things of that nature. Some programs will also require you to submit a letter of support from a provost, a dean, or another administrator. So make sure you know what those requirements are and plan ahead. Um, you want to make sure that your administration understands what the, the grant would support and how it would benefit your institution. And then finally, uh, as Tamika mentioned, uh, remember to build a strong relationship with your sponsored research office. With a few exceptions, um, they are the ones who will actually be submitting your application through grants.gov. So you want to make sure you know of any requirements that they may have on their end. Uh, for example, some institutions uh, require that completed applications be submitted to the sponsored research office um, a week or more before the actual grant deadline. Um, there may be other uh, requirements, internal requirements that your institution might have. So get to know the people in your sponsored research office and understand what those 
um, any of those internal um, requirements might be. Your sponsored research office can also be a tremendous help with things like putting together your grant budget. Uh, so involve them at the beginning of your application process, not just at the end. And now I'm gonna turn things over to my colleague, Mark. Thanks, Julia. So uh, now I'm gonna talk about how we can help you as you work on a grant application to one of our agencies. And there are many ways that we can help you. First, agency staff are available to answer questions and provide advice. So look for program contacts in the notice of funding opportunity or on the websites for each agency. In some programs, we can also read and comment on a draft application. Not all grant programs offer this service, so check the program guidelines or the notice of funding opportunity to see if program staff can read a draft and what the due date is for the draft. Once you submit a complete application, peer reviewers will provide comments on the strengths and weaknesses of your application based on the review criteria published in the notice of funding opportunity. And we make those reviewer evaluations available to you, which could be a great way to revise for resubmission if you're application is not funded the first time. The most important message for this presentation is that we want you to get in touch with us. And if you're not sure where to start, use the email addresses shown on this slide where you can send general inquiries. Staff who monitor these inboxes can make sure that your inquiries get to the right person in our agencies. And really, no question is too small or unimportant. So if you're if you just wanna reach out to somebody and get a, a, a human to respond, try one of these email addresses for each of our agencies. Next slide. So uh, here's some application advice that might help give you a competitive edge as you get started on your application. First, make sure that you choose the right program. Aligning your project to the goal of the grant program is essential. Even the best written application isn't likely to be funded the program you submit to isn't designed to fund what you propose to do. And this is why a conversation with program staff can be helpful. We can talk through your ideas and help you find the right program for what you want to accomplish. Once you've found the right program, read the guidelines carefully. The guidelines are your blueprint to a strong application and will tell you everything you need to include in your application including any supporting materials. The review criteria are listed in the guidelines and you should make sure that your application addresses those. In your proposal also, you need to make a strong case for your project and why it's important to you. You should also develop a clear and realistic work plan. Reviewers are experienced professionals who have most likely completed similar types of projects that are proposed in your application and they don't react well to vague applications. They're looking for evidence in your application that you can be successful if funded. Be sure to include all the required elements of an application. If the program requires supporting materials, such as a letter from an administrator or a reading list, be sure to include those. Missing elements in her, your application. Finally, pay attention to the details. For example, if there's a recommended format or sequence for application elements, be sure to follow it. For their page limits or required fonts or type sizes, pay attention to those. For example, if uh, application requires a two-page CV from the people who would be involved in your grant, make sure that when they condense their full-length CVs down to two pages that they highlight those elements that are most relevant to your project. These details might seem small, but they really can make a difference in the evaluation and review process. And finally, be sure to proofread. In fact, have someone else proofread if you can. Your eye will miss something if you're, been, if you're the primary writer and uh, because your brain knows what it's supposed to see in that text. So ask a colleague to look over your application carefully. And now I wanna share the ways that you can help us. So as described earlier, we review your proposals using panelists from colleges, universities, and cultural institutions from around the country. And we're always looking for people who are willing to serve in this capacity. Almost all reviews are conducted in a virtual format and reviewers receive a modest honorarium for their service. Serving on a panel is also a great way to get an inside look at how the review process works and expand 
and help expand your knowledge and awareness of the work being done by your peers across the country. We have the links for each of our agencies here. Uh, you can also put them in the chat. And this is where you can submit your information if you want to be a reviewer. This doesn't obligate you to anything. It just indicates to us that you are interested in being considered and should your expertise fit the needs of a future panel, you may be selected. And we're also love for you to connect with us on social media. And our Twitter handles are here. So feel free to follow all of us or any of us. And now I wanna hand it back to Julia. Thanks, Mark. And now we're going to turn to our uh, distinguished panel of grantees who will uh, be able to discuss their real world experience with the grant process. Uh, as I mentioned, we have uh, three grantees with us this morning. Uh, Lenora Helm Hammonds, who is Associate Professor of Music at North Carolina Central University. She received a grant from the National Endowment for the Arts to develop the university's Teaching Artist Certificate Program, the first program of its kind in the University of North Carolina system and at an HBCU. We also have Tina Rollins, Director of the William R. and Norman B. Harvey Library at Hampton University. She received a Laura, Bur Laura Bush 21st Century Librarian grant from the Institute of Museum and Library Services to develop and implement practices and initiatives that change, evolve, and improve the experiences of people of color working within the library and information science field. And finally, Logan Wiedenfeld is Assistant Professor of English at Alcorn State University. He received a Humanities Connections Planning Grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities to develop a team talk curriculum that would combine classical rhetoric, science writing, experiential learning, and community outreach. So um, we have come up with a few questions to get the conversation started, but if those of you um, in the audience have questions for the panelists, feel free to put them in the chat and um, we can include those in the conversation as well. Um, and I guess the, the first question that, uh, that we'll start off with is how did you learn about the grant program that uh, that you applied for? Um, and I guess any one of you all can can start us off. I'll jump in. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Julia. Um, I was alerted of the opportunity for the grant for which I applied from our uh, State Arts Council. The arts education director at that time, Sharon Hill, was very astute on, you know, getting the information out to um, those um, parts in the state and those people in the state who were working in arts and education, arts education activities. And I had reached out to her probably about six months before then to introduce her to the program we were doing uh, in the teaching artist certificate program on campus. She then turned me uh, to at Nancy Dougherty at uh, NEA in arts education, who at that time uh, was a teaching um, arts education specialist and kind of the dominoes went from there. They all came on campus, we talked. So it was important to um, not be a uh, uh, quiet about something that you're doing that you're excited about on your campus and think that people will find you. I just started reaching out to tell people, this is what we have, this is what we're doing. Who do you know and um, how can you help? What, what do I not know? And so talking and communicating was really important about that process. Thanks. And I think that's a, a, a great point that you raise. Um, there are states, state uh, arts agencies in every state. Um, there are also um, state humanities councils in, in every state. And these local or state resources can be a really great um, place to look both for information, um, as in your case, but also for um, uh, resources and other opportunities as well. So I think, thank you so much for, for bringing that up. Those are wonderful, wonderful organizations as well. Um, Logan or, or Tina, does either one of you want to, to jump in? Sure, I'll jump in. Mm -hmm. So I actually learned about opportunities through the IMS, IMLS through our research and um, office of sponsored programs here on campus. Mm -hmm. Always get grant, grant alerts um, concerning different opportunities in our field. So the grant that we have now is actually our second IMLS grant that we okay. received. So in 2017, we were actually awarded a grant to hold a 
national forum on the same topic um, concerning the recruitment and retention of people of color within the field. And so we were able to take that national forum experience and look at the outcome of those and actually apply for another grant, which we received in 2020, to further investigate and explore the experiences of people of color and also to create um, kind of a cohort of participants who will go in and EDI consultants who will work with librarians and other people uh, that work within library information science to actually build EDI initiatives and also mm -hmm. to do different things with assessment and seeing what those opportunities are, what are the challenges. So this was actually our second IMLS grant, mm -hmm. but we get so many alerts from our offices of research here on campus, and it's always great to have a connection with those offices because they'll alert you to a lot of opportunity, especially within your unit. That, that is an excellent, excellent point. Thank you. Uh, and Logan, so how did you hear about uh, the, the program that you applied to? Um, to be honest with you, I can't recall if it was an institutional email that I received through the, the grants coordinator or if it was departmental. I know that we often get it from both ends. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm in the English department and um, our former chair would often send out, send out um, notifications about opportunities from the NEA or the NEA, mm -hmm. different funding opportunities. Um, and once I became aware of the, um, the NEH Humanities Con Connections Grant, I realized that there was an upcoming seminar, which I attended. And then shortly thereafter, I actually attended this very panel or something um, like it um, last year. So, um, you know, if if you're interested in writing grants um, or writing grant proposals, um, there are lots of people on campus who, um, and I, you know, I can't speak for every campus, but I would imagine there are lots of people at, at most campuses who are eager to um, share information about opportunities. Great, thanks. And that actually is a good segue to my next question, which was, you know, what was the application process like for, for you all? I know for, for folks who have never, maybe never applied for uh, a federal grant before, it can maybe seem a little scary <laughs> to sort of throw this, this application uh, out there. So what was, the, what was the process like for you? Um, and what kind of support did you receive uh, from your institution? Um, and then did you receive any help from the grant making uh, institution as well? So sort of a three part question. And again, just anyone feel free to, to jump in. I'll jump in. Mm -hmm. sure. So in the first iteration of trying to apply for a grant, it was very intimidating. <laughs> <laughs> I was actually um, very fortunate to link up with a another uh, with our with our museum director at the time, who actually walked me through the grant writing process and told me what I needed to do. But if I can give one piece of advice, know the kind of know the process of applying for a grant on your campus, because the that process is a whole different other experience than just writing the grant. Oftentimes, it may be one budget that you have, have to look at that may be submitted to your university or your organization, and then the other budget. Now, the trick is the two budgets have to match up, and you also have to remember that your university will take indirect and direct. So even though you may have a grant for a million dollars, your university may take 48 to 50% of that. So really you don't have a million dollars anymore to do actually what you want to do in your project. So um, it can be very daunting at first, but you have to read the entire um, grant. Also look at what is allowable and what's not allowable and know your, um, know your grant process. Um, Julia mentioned before some, or I believe it was Julia who mentioned before, I'm not sure. I could be forgetting a little bit, but someone mentioned that some, some organizations require you to turn it in a week ahead of time. Some may be 30 days ahead of time. Some could be more than that. So make sure that you know your process on campus. Um, 
I received a lot of support from my university, but I had to also go out and solicit that support. A lot of times when people know that you're trying to do something and you're passionate about it, they will be your cheerleaders. And it's always great to have a cheerleader in the office of sponsored programs who is going to help you and work with you and take your calls and return your emails. So it's always good to make their connections. Um, I'm always a cheerleader of IMLS. I have had fantastic support from IMLS on so many levels, especially Sarah and um, before I worked with, um, I believe it was uh, Sandy. So I've had support from all levels at IMLS whenever I've needed a meeting or a call or, or, some, or something like that. They're always willing to jump on and you know help us. And, you know, it's, it's great to kind of form that community around you so that you won't be so intimidated in going in and applying for the grant, but especially know your connections on campus that will help walk you through what you need to be walked through. Thanks. Anyone else want to jump in, Lenora? Yeah, I would have to agree with uh, my colleague, Tina, because of the same reasons. On our university campus, we have an Office of Sponsored Research, and they are they were amazing at helping me through the process on campus to getting those um, tick marks done to make sure the budget's matched, to understand indirect cost, indirect um, all of the things about personnel, about um, the parts of the personnel configuration that you have to account for in terms of benefits, things that I would never have thought about, just a worrying about what do I need to get my project done? What do I need to, um, to figure out what are the areas of that budget that are important? So um, uh, to be able to go to your campus to campus cheerleaders and help was really, really uh, a, uh, a pivotal point for me. The NEA staff were amazing, especially because what I wanted to accomplish and what my project was about wasn't necessarily described in the grant guidelines verbatim. So the discussion with them helped to clarify what is it exactly that that met their guidelines and their vision and goals for the funding that they wanted to provide. And um, the time that they took, especially with the teaching artist specialists who happened to be coming to our state and then came to our campus to talk with my senior administrators, that was really the glue too, that gave me um, the, the, the uh, support I needed for the time to, to create the grant. I think it, um, the, the most important driver for me during the application process was thinking about champion, championing my vision for the students, for the outcomes of the project that I wanted to apply for. Um, that drove me through the things that seemed like barriers or how do I have time to write a grant and I teach four classes, you know, all of that, so. Thanks, and Logan, so what was your experience like? Um, I, I want to echo uh, my colleagues. Um, I, I had, I was blessed to have a great grants coordinator who, um, you know, without his help, um, there's no way I would have been able to turn in a, a successful grant. Um, and part of that has to do with, I mean, turning in a grant is, um, it's not just writing it. I mean, there's a whole process of bureaucratic hurdles that you have to jump through. Um, just navigating grants.gov um, to me is like an anxiety attack waiting to happen. <laughs> um, so I had help from my grants co coordinator, like tracking down Dunn's numbers and all. all I mean, there's a lot of um, different moving pieces that come together in submitting a grant proposal. In my head, initially, it was like submitting an article for publication. I can do that privately without the blessing of my institution. Um, I don't need anybody to sign off on it. When you're applying for a grant, you have to have um, the support of your dean, or not necessarily, but in my case, I needed the support of my dean, I needed the support of my provost, and ultimately the support of my president. So I had to um, get letters of support for each, from each of them. And I didn't realize that um, until, you know, a couple of weeks out and my grants coordinator was like, have you gotten your letters of support? So he was um, 
you know, integral in my success. Um, and I, I owe him a lot. And as far as the NEH goes, I mean, like the, I forget who it was who mentioned it. Um, and I know that each of the granting agencies offer something similar, but I mean, the fact that um, like in my case, I received feedback. I sent like um, a really crappy first draft of my um, proposal um, and got like really thorough, thoughtful, insightful feedback, which allowed me to kind of reframe my, um, my entire project. And moreover, allowed me to bring my project back in line with notice of funding. Um, so, I mean, that was something that I think the NEH people I worked with were especially helpful at, reminding me to return, you know, we tell our students, you know, read the syllabus, read the syllabus, read the syllabus. I mean, that, that NOFO is your syllabus. And um, most of the information, or a lot of the information is there when it comes to like how to structure your narrative, how to structure the actual proposal. So, um, you know, I received great feedback. People like real human people would answer the phone when I would call and they were warm and kind and helpful and thoughtful. Um, there was no like, um, you know, automated, you know, press three for X. Um, it was a great experience and, you know, expecting um, just, you know, having experience with other bureaucratic entities. And I'm not saying that these granting agents, you know, I think y'all are, y'all are kind of in a different ballpark altogether. Um, but, you know, like in my head, I was expecting something much more, um, and personal and um, bureaucratic. What I found were people who were um, eager to help me and, and um, they did. And I, I'm very thankful for that. Thank you. Um, just as a reminder to the attendees, I have a few more questions for the panelists, but if there is something that you would like to uh, ask them, please feel free to put it in the chat and, and we will um, relay the question to, to the panel. Um, but um, I will take the, the chair's prerogative and ask, so um, what impact has your grant had um, on you, your career, your students, your institution? And again, anyone, we're, we're very informal here. Anyone feel free to jump in first, Lenora? Um, I think that the impact was much more than I expected. Uh, on campus, it gave the respect that was needed for the program to be considered uh, necessary and important. Uh, it was a certificate program. It is a certificate program. And so to a degree granting institution, certificates are kind of a new idea. And um, so it garnered the respect that allowed for growth in, in the capacity of the program and for um, having other faculty wanting to come on board to assist in, in being one of the, the, the teaching um, faculty in, in the certificate. It was also uh, a way for um, funding, other funding sources to be, um, to be attracted to the program and to the outcomes. Um, the, uh, at that time, I was going and applying for tenure. I was going through my tenure track process. So it assisted in, in, in satisfying one of the tick marks for my tenure. Um, and it, it helped to uh, bring the idea because the teaching artist is an idea that um, meets a lot of um, confrontation on campuses because there is the myth that it interferes with the education curricula or the teaching curricula for those who are, are, are trying to acquire a teaching degree. And um, it's a very different uh, niche in, in education. So it helped getting that NEA support and that stamp of approval was a big milestone. It also allowed the artists who were in uh, the College of Arts, Social Sciences and Humanities for the students who were dancers, musicians, composers, writers to think differently about what they could do in their professional careers. They're like, oh, what's a teaching artist? And so it was an education on campus to the students of career niches that they could follow or add to their work. 
Um, and lastly, it created a, a way for those activists who were artists in my community to have, a, uh, to be able to say, oh, NEA thinks that this is important. NEA thinks that this is something that's viable and interesting to, to support and fund. Therefore, my work is viable and important and interesting uh, to support, not just someone who was a dancer, a writer, a painter, a musician. So the arts activism that started to build up in my community and some of our graduates now have created these uh, community activist projects led by artists that were supported and graduated through our teaching artist program. And that was because of the NEA support. Great, thanks. Logan or, or Tina, when you, one of you wanna go next? Mm -hmm. um, I had always wanted to do a grant revolving around diversity within the, within the field. The, and the, the driving factor for the grant was, you know, a lot of my experiences in the field as the only person of color within the room. But I also, as, as a lot of people of color have in arts and humanities and, and mm -hmm. lots of other cultural institutions, so um, I, I was the only person of color in the room. There's always been this driving force within the LIS field to recruit and retain people of color. But I had so many friends who were people of color who were leaving the field because they were not supported by their institutions. They were experiencing microaggressions on an insane level. And I wanted to um, talk about it. I felt that it was a need to bring people from different facets, facets of my field to talk about what better place than Hampton University. Hampton University back in the 20s had a library science school um, and it educated people of color. Um, it ended like in, I believe the late 20s, early 30s, but um, Hampton University was also the, uh, we, they also held the first uh, conference of libraries of color. And I was like, wow, we held this back in the 20s and we're still talking about this today. Where have we been? So um, I kind of wanted to bring together that history and also talk about what was going on in the field. And so the, the results of that were very, very far reaching. I did not expect it to go that far. I did not expect that grant to kind of um, drive into other things with research opportunities speaking opportunities, um, opportunities to be on other grants or other panels on a local, regional, and national level, but to also, um, you know, it, it brought a lot of respect to our library that we were not only just looking at, um, we were looking at the profession from a broader perspective mm -hmm. and it impacted our organizations and our students and how it's necessary to have professionals of color within the field. So I was able to take that experience and kind of look at other things and have different instructors say, hey, would you do a presentation about um, library science within my class? Hey, can we partner and do this? I think this is an important field for our students to know about. Um, so it just had a really, really broad impact that I did not expect both on campus and on a professional level. Um, and it's opened up lots of research opportunities for us also. So um, it, it's, it's been a very, very interesting ride to be on. I did not expect it to be like this. I thought after that first grant, hey, we have a conversation. I do some writings about it. But so many people were like, no, we have to do more. We have to continue to be on this. And it was especially important after the social unrest, after the, um, after the George Floyd killing, um, we knew that we had to continue to talk about this because we knew that we were at a point in the world where it would be even more necessary to make sure that people were receiving information and learning how to disseminate information, learning to connect with information professionals and seeing the, themselves reflected within um, library organizations and cultural organizations. So it, it was very, very far reaching. Thank you. And Logan? Yes. Um, I mean, there are lots of different ways to answer this question, each of which is important. And um, I won't have enough time to address each of them. But, you know, I will say that, you know, as a junior faculty member at, at Alcorn State University, um, one of the most, um, I, I guess, personal 
impacts is it allowed me to um because this this particular grant that i that we were awarded my team myself and my team were awarded involves um you know bringing different departments from different parts of the university together um to work um on developing a curriculum that impacts each of them so it you know the, the grant was a way of bridging these kind of um impasses that i think exist on most universities you know i remember you know where i did my phd you know i didn't know where the engineering building was or the you know like it, it was a big monstrosity and each little insular department pretty much is its own um world and you know I, i'm generalizing i'm being a, a bit unfair but there is i think it's certainly the case that um there isn't enough interdisciplinary conversations um, and relationships that exist on most college campuses in the united states so this grant allowed me to um, feel like i was a part of the university writ large because i was um, working with people in the department of agriculture and and biology you know i Alcorn is a land grant institution and has historically emphasized um, ag and the life sciences. And I teach in the English department. We're pretty small. And of course, we all know, um, you know, if we work in the arts, if we work in the humanities, we all know that um, we have seen our, our departments um, slowly but surely whittling away. Um, and, and that's terrifying and sad. And hopefully it can be um, reversed. But, um, you know, this, this was one way in which to address that kind of STEM fetishization that is um, happening at a lot of institutions, basically to show that, um, you know, what we do in the humanities undergirds um, these other um, disciplines as well, you know, as part of it. And, you know, that was something that was important for my department, but it was also something that I think I was able to communicate to a lot of my peers across the university and within the community um, in a really productive way. I mean, I, I, I believe in the humanities um, profoundly and the arts. And I think that um, they, they are, you know, they, we shouldn't view them as something separate from STEM, but as something that um, works in conjunction with STEM. So um, anyway, I, I mean, broadly speaking, that, that was the big impact for me, was, was um, making, that, making those connections and also communicating that those connections aren't just um, artificial, but they're, they're already there. You know, people in the sciences write, people in ag write, and um, the connections that we're making are, um, you know, they're, they're central to, I think, a healthy um, idea of a holistic education. I have to agree with that. If I just uh, piggyback on, on what Logan was saying and uh, to confirm what Tina said of being the only person of color in the room, it's a lot of times on decisions being made about arts and education, arts education, and the focus of our uh, grant and project was professional development of teaching artists. So the, that was really important to, to see the absence of uh, persons of color in the teaching artist field in my state and wanting to have a program to do something focused on it for our university was really huge and, and move that conversation forward out into the community and the state. And now um, there's so many more programs in our state for teaching artists of color, arts organizations of color. It advanced the, um, advanced the conversation to programs and activities that are now happening as a result of having that support. But also what Logan, Logan was saying is that just the, I love the word you use, Logan, the fetishism of, uh, of, of STEM, you know, and then some people say STEAM, you know, the connector to um, all of the ideas, the paradigm that STEM is the way to go and that's the way to educate our students and have them, um, you know, um, have success in the 21st century landscape. 
but the humanities are so necessary to being human and in those other fields and um, the impact in that, that you can't have the intercultural competence that you need without the humanities. You can't have people mature into culturally competent um, without the humanities. So the, the impact was really important. Thanks. Uh, we do have one question. Um, you know, each of you mentioned the uh, the importance of the relationship that you have with your sponsored research office, and we did have a question from uh, the audience about um, the composition of of your inst your institution's sponsored research offices. Um, you know, how many people uh, are in those offices and. Uh, whether you think that there might be a correlation between the, the size or composition of, of that office and the success um, that you or other faculty might have had with, with grants, you know, sort of what makes for a successful uh, sponsored research office, I guess. I'll answer that. Our, mm -hmm. our office here at Hampton is very small. I believe it would be probably under, under five people. It could be smaller than that. Um, but we, and I imagine, I was going to say it could be because we're a private institution, but I imagine the offices might be small at every campus. I'm not sure about the correlation to funded re research projects. I'm not sure about how would that correlate with the size mm -hmm. of the staff or not, but I can imagine if there were more staff, it would be easier for, um, it would be more, more man or woman power person power to actually go through and uh, review applications and, and give additional one-on-one -on -one help yeah. with, with people. But I think, I, I think that more so the dedication of the department matters as much as the size of it does. Because if you have a department that's dedicated, they will do the work in making sure that applicants have what they need. So I would, I would outweigh dedication against um, against the size of it, mm -hmm. um, I, I would probably say that. Okay. Two, I too think that we have a small office and at some time, at some point during my process, there were maybe two people and they were looking for uh, roles to fill in that, in that area. But my, um, I was so, I was like, I'm, I'm going to be unstoppable. And so whatever they, I would tell them, what's the next step? What do we need? So your work is really important to, to, to encourage the senior administration. We need more people in this area. This mm -hmm. process was unnecessarily this or that because we need more people in this area. So you advocate for that area to be a little more, um, and, you know, to have them be a, a fully funded and fully mm -hmm. resourced. Um, but your work in, in that process is just as important. What else do I need to do? What what can I do to think ahead? What documents don't I do I not have? You know, that it's a very recursive process that so you support mm -hmm. each other. Great. Thank you. And Logan? Um again I wanna I wanna echo everything that my colleagues I mean I can tell that we've had similar experiences, which is good. I think it, it goes to show that our our um you know our sponsored research, our grants coordinators are um you know that they're they're doing their jobs and they're really good at it. Um yeah. what I was saying is you know coming from uh an institution that has traditionally and historically um, not focused on ag and life sciences, but certainly like, you know, that's where our grant money, as an institution, we're getting lots of money from like the um, NIFRA and AFRI, like these, these, or, these big um, outfits that give lots of research dollars um, to ag institutions like ours. So um, I think I enjoyed being able to work with um, my grants coordinator on a humanities grant and to kind of um, pitch to him ideas that he wasn't accustomed to hearing because, you know, we, we like in the Department of Agriculture, um, writing grants is like, I mean, that's how you get tenure. Um, it, I think it's, 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 I don't know this for sure, for sure I'm kind of, um, 
this is conjecture, but I would imagine it's less common for those of us in humanities to apply for grants than it is for people in other disciplines. So um, it was it was enlightening, um, hopefully both for my grants coordinator and certainly for myself to kind of talk through my ideas with him um, about you know how the humanities work in tandem with other disciplines, how they can, how they can kind of complement each other. And I also just want to like mention um, um, the budget office, um, because of course, I think it was Tina who mentioned how um, kind of horrifying budgeting can be when you deal with like indirect costs and fringe benefits and all of these um, technical sounding scary financial words about which I knew nothing. Um, I couldn't have written a budget without the budget's office. In fact, you know, they did it for me for the most part. Um, because that's something that is, um, you know, that, that's another aspect of the process that is pretty rigid. Um, you know, there are set amounts for like indirect costs. You can't just wing it there. You have to have your institutional blessing and their, their fingerprint needs to be on it in order for your grant to be viable. Um, so the budget people, they are um, a godsend and they are absolutely essential um, unless you happen to have like, um, you know, unless you moonlight as an accountant or something like that for another university, which I don't. One more thing I'd like to add is there was a recommendation I think Mark have, may have made to be a panelist, a reviewer in uh, for your uh, for for any of the organizations here. And I was asked to be one, and I really was able to see both sides to to work uh, closely with uh, our arts education. Ayana Hudson, she's amazing with her staff, and learn more about what their vision and missions are, and also. So uh, to understand, and to, if you're a reviewer, you look at so many different grants and you're able to see, oh, you think about that or to really look closely at the guidelines and from another point of view. And that perspective was invaluable for moving forward, writing reports, et cetera. So I really recommend um, that people become reviewers and panelists. That's an excellent point. Um, and we have we have actually reached the end of, of our session. It's, it's 1033. So I want to uh, thank everyone who attended the session. I want to especially thank our wonderful panel. Um, I think, you know, people came a little bit for the information we had, but they really came for, for you all. So thank you so much for agreeing to be a part of, of the, the panel and for your insights. Um, we are so, so glad that you were able to, to join us this morning. Um, just one quick final reminder. Um, if you are interested, you can sign up for our cluster newsletter. Um, the link um, is in the was in the chat. Um, we also have a page on the White House Initiative on HBCUs website for our cluster, so you can check that page out as well. Um, that has more information about each of our agencies and the kinds of resources that we offer for HBCUs. So once again, um, thank you to all of the attendees and a huge thank you to um, my federal colleagues and to our wonderful group of panelists. Thank you. <laughs>